Thank you so much. It's so great to be back in Tulsa to be here and to be with Ed and Martha and be back with them as many of you are such good friends and they are too. And I appreciate the invitation. I always enjoy being here to speak to you all. I think you all have the best attendance on a Wednesday night series of any church I ever go to anywhere, any place in the country. And I really enjoy coming to be a part of this series and being a part of your church here. Uh, Marla's with me tonight. She is my fiance. I talked some woman into uh, making a commitment to me, and so um, don't tell her anything about me. And I would really appreciate that very much. We've got her fooled pretty well. Uh, I do get to travel around and do some drumming. That die drumming show is really fun. I've got a uh, I've got, I grew up drumming in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then got tired of high-maintenance guitar players. And so I wrote my own show. I've got a vintage Ringo Starr set that I play 60s on. I've got a clear Vista Light Keith Moon Who set that I play 70s music on. And then I've got a Neil Pert Rush Art Star 2 with a cage and all kinds of equipment that I play on and uh, go around and get to do that, and I'd much rather do that than teach college, but I can't figure out a way to pay the bills doing that, but <laughs> it's an awful lot of fun. We have a really, really good time. I, I'll tell you this one thing kind of interesting. My, my rehearsal hall is out by Love Field. It's in a big set of storage units because it makes so much noise, and it's a big, huge thing. It's about 30 feet long, about 15 feet wide, and I'm in there because I don't make, uh, make so much noise. The airplanes don't bother you. There's all kinds of people around me, and the guy next door to me, you don't know who any of these people are because they're all renting storage space, but the guy next to me was there yesterday. I was in there setting up some drums, and he came out of his storage unit wearing a t-shirt that said, I heart explosives. And I think I'm going to have to move my rehearsal hall when I get back to town. <laughs> so I'm a little bit concerned, a little bit anxious tonight. We've got some work that we need to do over the next 25 minutes on a very important text. To begin working on this, I need to tell you, tonight I want to tell you two stories. The first story goes like this. When, when Marla and I were going to school in Dallas, you could graduate from the Dallas Independent School District and at your church take a survey in the New Testament and a survey in the Old Testament on Sunday and Wednesday nights take an exam at the end of the year and they'd give you half a credit for each one of those courses to apply toward a public school degree in the state of Texas for taking a Bible class. I don't think you can do that anymore, but it was pretty remarkable. My, I, I did it my sophomore and my junior year. My senior year, the elders at White Rock in Dallas came to me where I was a member and dad was an elder, came to me and they said, would you teach this course this next year? And that's the first Bible class I ever taught uh, was my senior year up at the church. Now the reason I tell you that story is to say that that curriculum 30 years ago made the point that the heart and soul of understanding the core relationship between God and man is revealed in our text tonight. Our text tonight is Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 3, which is the promise to Abraham, which is central to understanding the entire story of the Bible. It is absolutely foundational. The story, as you've been covering it here, you understand that there's the upper story and the lower story. The upper story in, in the story material is God's part. And in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, it reads, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, this is a reading you've probably heard most of your life if you grew up going to church at all. Abram, at this point in time, is 75 years old. He is not a spring chicken. That's looking better all the time to me, but <laughs> he's been around for a while. He has no descendants. He and his wife, Sarah, um, are approached by God, and he initiates this covenant relationship with him. The first thing we want to say about this thing tonight is that God places this covenant in a central role in the biblical text. Let me see if I can just 
summarize that for you for a moment. If you go back to Genesis, the first chapter, you have God speaking to man and saying, I am going to bless you. There will be a relationship between God and man that is positive, it is fruitful, and it's going to be a blessing to you. You come later in chapter 12, and he expands that to Abram, and he gives this sevenfold covenant to him. You're going to have a great name, you're going to have descendants as numerous as the sands on the sea or the stars in the air. And he, he goes through, those who curse you will be cursed, those who bless you will be blessed. And then we go to chapter 23 in Genesis and he repeats it to Isaac. Then we go to chapter 26 and he repeats it again to Jacob. And so all the way through Genesis he's repeating that thing. Then we go to Exodus chapter 3, and once again, he repeats the covenant, this time to Moses. And he said the same thing's going to happen. This nation that Moses is going to form and lead is going to be a blessing. And once again, he lays this same covenant out that is our text tonight. And then we get all, we roll all the way to the New Testament. And it's the same story. It's one story all the way through this thing. We get to the book of Acts, and in Acts chapter 3, Peter is up speaking to the Jewish Christians. And he reminds them in Acts chapter 3 that they are inheritance of this covenant. That God was going to bless them, and it's through Christ that the blessing has come. And then we come to the book of Galatians, once again, chapter 3. 3 is a big number in this little layout. In Galatians, Paul is writing to the Gentile Christians. And once again, he says to them, he says, you all have been grafted in. You have been brought into this particular promise. In fact, I think I marked it. Yeah, Galatians 3 and verse 6. Paul wrote, Consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. That's you and me. We come into covenant relationship according to Paul right here. He's right about us. The Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So we're brought into this covenant relationship as Gentiles even though we're not in covenant relationship in the Old Testament. And then finally, to kind of put a bookmark on this little survey of what God's doing here, in Hebrews chapter 11, that chapter of faith, they write about the faith of Abraham as he follows God and is in covenant relationship. And the Hebrew writer says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. And then that beautiful verse, one of my favorite ones. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. When we understand the upper story in your series, the story you're in this summer. When you understand what God is doing here, it's very, very simple. It's very, very profound. A covenant was a relationship between a supreme king and a vassal king. And that supreme king approached that vassal servant king and said, I will, uncondition I will not unconditionally be in relationship with you, but I will reach out and I will put you in relationship with me. And there's nothing that you've done to earn that. But because you're in relationship with me, you will have protection, you will have blessings, you will be in my empire, and what he required back from that vassal king that he was in covenant relationship was supreme loyalty, adoration, and very, very interesting, even in the covenants that were made by human kings, 
the word that was often used was love. The supreme king said, you will adore me. And sometimes would say, you will, I'm going to use the W word here, what? You will worship me. So when God initiates this covenant with his people, and ultimately when he initiates this covenant with us, we accept it. And interestingly enough, in ancient times, the supreme king was often called the father. And so it is then, we stand today on a Wednesday night in Tulsa, Oklahoma, eating our cookies and considering our busy lives as literally we are the inheritors, we are the vassal kings of the covenant that was established long ago back in Genesis chapter 12. It just rolls forward. Is this making sense? Amen. Amen. This is our identity. This is our inheritance. This is our will. This is our father. And it is, <laughs> it is all at his initiation. All we do is say, yes. We accept. And we follow in complete faithfulness. And he says, I ask you to love me. And I want you to call me Father. Second story. Spent 10 years on the faculty at Oklahoma Christian. 10 of the best years of my life. Knew many of you there and got to have a great relationship with this church while I was over there. At the end of that period of time, we made a decision together that the work I was doing at the Institute needed to come to an end. And we closed down the Marriage and Family Institute. And I began considering what was going to be the next chapter of my life. When I began looking at that, I began considering and was looking at my academic upbringing. When I got out of high school, I went to college and did a degree in religion and ministry. Got that one out of the way, and then I did another degree in communications because I thought I was going to be a speech teacher. <laughs> at the end of that one, Paul Faulkner was opening a marriage and family institute and said, you might make a good family shrink. Why don't you come and do that? That's just another 60 hours of graduate school. Okay, so two more years. And when we got through with that, I was working on my doctorate in adult education. Ten years, four fields, 300 hours. And at the end of that nine-year period of time, I was tired of... I was sick of school. I was just sick of it. I was tired of it. I love school, but I was tired of it. Tom Eaves was my major professor. Tom Eaves was a phenomenal mind. He had a PhD in nuclear science and worked on the original nuclear projects out there in the salt flats developing nuclear weapons. Got tired of that and went back and did a PhD in adult education because he thought that'd be more interesting. And set up a big... Yeah, I know. Us professor types are just a little bit strange. And came to TWU and set up a, just a, just a world-class program in adult education. He was my major professor. And those were in the days where you didn't get online and choose your topics and choose your courses. And they didn't have the tracks laid out and mentoring and all this other stuff. You got into a doctoral program. You showed up at your major professor's office. And he said, this is what you're going to take. And you're going to take classes until I tell you you're through taking classes. And I may let you write a dissertation for me if you shut up and act nice. <laughs> yes, sir. And coming into the last year working with Tom, and Tom was a great man, and he was not that way. He was compassionate and kind, but your major professor told you this is what you're going to do. Coming into that last year, I was ready to get through, and he called me in, and he said, you're going to be working in nonprofits and churches and counseling centers and all these heavy-duty kinds of human services. I want you to work for one year in an internship on your day off in business because I want you to understand how adult ed is done out there in the corporate setting. And I was saying, well, what a waste of time. I don't see any reason why I need to be doing this. So he made an appointment for me at Arthur Anderson Accounting Firm with James Caldwell, who was opening a division in professional consulting. 
And Jim had just come from Texas Tech, and I interviewed with him, terribly intimidating man. And he said, yeah, I'll take you on as an intern, and you can come down here on Fridays on your day off, and you can work for me. And I'm thinking, I'm working for everybody. This is just wonderful. <laughs> I'm totally out of control in my life. So I show up, and I'm working for Jim, and he called me in one day, and he hands me a set of a diagrams of papers, big rolls of paper. Looked like, just looked like a big um, architect's schematics of a building. I mean, they were just huge. And he hands this thing to me, and he said, he said, business and industry is going to go technology. And he said, someday technology and the human operations of a corporation are going to combine and unite. And he said, we're going to have to know how to bring the human side and production side and technology all together. And he said, there's a schematic in here called Method E, and he said, I want you to study this because it is a methodology for consulting with companies who are going to be revolutionized by the coming technological revolution. And I didn't have the foggiest idea of what he just said to me. <laughs> I just took the papers and headed to a conference, rolled them up, and literally they go from me to about you right there. I mean, the papers were just huge. And I studied for weeks and weeks, and I didn't have the foggiest idea what I was looking at. Leave that. Can I leave that story for half a second and take you back to the text? Let me take you back to the text because if you leave chapter 12 in Genesis and you go over to, help me Rhonda, help, chapter 16. We've got God's part, now let's do man's part for just a second. Man's part, going back to Abraham, Abram and the story, Abram's been promised, you leave the land, you leave this, I'm going to give you a descendant. But Abram and Sarah's problem is they don't have a what? They don't have a son. Big problem. We get to chapter 16, and it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my, hand, my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. Of course he did. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai took his wife, her Egyptian maidservant named Hagar, and, he, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress, and all kinds of problems ensued. The story that you all are going through, the curriculum going through, maintains that there is God's part, the upper story, and the lower story is man's part. In this story of Abram, Sarai, the promise, the covenant, there is God's peace. But then we come down to man's peace. And when we look at Sarah's response, we see that they have waited 10 years. Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarah, are now 85 years old. She's looking at the situation and going, ain't no way I'm going to have kids. In fact, I'm wondering if he's got dementia and even heard this promise. <laughs> so she goes, I believe I'll take things, what? In my own hands. I believe God needs a little bit of help here. I believe I'll do something to kind of hurry this thing on along. Did she help? Or as we used to say in East Texas, did she help it or hurt it? <laughs> she made a mess out of this thing. But she thought she was what? She thought she was helping. And my point to you tonight, and the thing we're going to work on, the thing I want, to take, I want you to take away from this is, I identify so much with Sarah on this deal. Because I don't know how many times I've been assured by God, this is just fine, this is the way it's going to be. Sit down, big guy, everything's going to be just fine. And I can't cool my jets. I think God needs me to help him figure all this out. And I'll just get in the way, and when I do, what do I do with it? I make a mess. I know no one else in this room has ever done this. I'm the only one guilty of this thing. But this is the lower story. If the upper story is the faithfulness and wisdom of God, the lower story, my story, is the story of 
fickleness and doubt and self-confidence that there are times I really know when I really don't know. I had a very wise counselor and a very wise mentor tell me that one of the hardest things to do, and I'm going to use a phrase here that I want to leave with you. If you only take one thing from this lesson, this is the one you want to take with you. One of the hardest things in the world to do, yet one of the most important things in the world to do, is to learn to sit with the ambiguity. Say it again. Sitting with the ambiguity. And we're going to work on that one for a few minutes. Because I, I want you to go out here, I want you to leave tonight bothered and uncomfortable. I want you to go, I don't like the sounds of this. I know, I don't either. This is graduate school work. This is not high school level curriculum. This is advanced placement stuff. Because here's how it goes. We look at a problem and we think there is option A or option B, thesis, antithesis, or that's it. And if it ain't option A or it ain't option B, it must not be anything. And I better do something to figure this out and make A or B work, when in reality, the third option is to sit with it. It is to sit with the ambiguity and allow things to not be worked out for a period of time. That's what I'm advocating. That's exactly what Sarah needed to do. Sit with it. And it's terribly difficult to sit with the ambiguity because we don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't like to be in pain. No, not we. I. I'm going to let you hear me talking to me, and if you listen in, that's fine. I don't like to be uncomfortable. I don't like to be ambiguous. I don't like to not have the answers. I don't like to be moving forward. I don't know about the rest of you all. It is when we sit with the ambiguity, though, that we do our soul work. Sometimes we have to sit with a situation and the pain of that around us has to seep in and do some work on us that we won't do when we're comfortable. Sometimes we have to be stopped in our tracks and not be able to move this direction and not be able to move that direction in order to take a look at myself. Because I'm so busy blaming other people or blaming circumstances and finally I've got to sit with that thing and go, you know what? Maybe there's some things I need to take a look at about old Don. My response is normally to rush through the pain. It's to rush through the transition. It's to rush to a conclusion. It's to implement something to get something moving. I used to go into elders meetings on Wednesday nights with a church that will be unnamed. <laughs> Thirteen elders sitting around discussing a topic. That's a, that's, it's, just a, it's just a recipe for disaster. <laughs> but we had a guy in there and you could tell how frustrated he was getting because his, his forehead would start turning red. And it, when it got red enough, he'd slam his hand on the table and he'd say, I just think we need to make a motion to vote on something to get moving. What he was saying was, I'm just uncomfortable and I can't deal with the ambiguity. It is within the period of waiting that we learn about ourselves and we might possibly be open to learning some new things about God, our surroundings, and our approach to our problems. It's just possible that could occur and at no other point in time. The other thing we tend to do in the middle of the ambiguity, in the middle of the pain, in the middle of rushing through it, it oftentimes I'll go back instead of waiting on God, instead of being open to the possibility I don't have the answers, I'll go back and I will implement old patterns of behavior that I know are not good for me, but I do them anyway because they're what I'm familiar with.
And that's what Sarah did here. Patrilineal descent. We, pack, we practice bilateral descent. You're related to your mama and your daddy, both, equally. Patrilineal meant you're related to your patriarch, your daddy. So Abram had the major 51% of the vote on that thing. She knew there needed to be an heir through patrilineal descent. She decided, I'm going to fix that. So you loop back to a poor pattern of behavior. I'll give him the handmaiden, which meant in nine months, I'm jealous as I can be. Because there's an heir to the throne that doesn't have my blood. Looping back into old patterns that just destroy us. Now I know you all never do that. I do that. When problems build up and I get all restless and I'm not sure what's going on, I go to bed at night and I think I'm going to go to sleep. About 2 o'clock in the morning, I do what? I wake up. And then the brain turns on and what am I thinking about? All that junk. All that junk. And then I'm looking at the clock and it's 3 o'clock. And then it's 4 o'clock. And I'm thinking, Don, you're doing it to yourself again. again. Old patterns. Old patterns. What do we suggest? We suggest that sitting with the ambiguity does in fact prepare us for the next phase. If we can be patient upon the Lord, if we can wait, if we cannot pull the trigger too quickly, the soul work that is being done internally will in fact prepare us for what it is that we need to be doing when we get on down the road and we arrive at that place. There is critical and important work to be done going through that transition. I transition churches. And I was working with Garnett here for about, I don't know, two or three years. That's where I knew a number of you all. Working with the church in McKinney right now. Been with them a little over a year. One of the things we say to folks that are in transition in churches, they lose a minister. We were down in Mississippi this last weekend with a church down in Jackson. Been putting in a year looking for somebody. And people come along and say, why do you spend some time? Why don't you just go out and hire somebody? There's preachers everywhere. Well, it's because... There is a spiritual, emotional, psychic bond that occurs between minister and ministry. Church and preacher. Church and minister. And it takes some time to get that to pass through so you can begin a new phase, a new vision, a new time. But people oftentimes want to rush through that transition, hurry up and get somebody, and when they do, it doesn't work out. Why? Because the people didn't do their work in between times to prepare for the next phase of development. So my question to you to get up into your life, my question to you is this. When you're presented with the pause, the comma, the stall, the wait, the ambiguity, when that lands in your lap, do you have the guts to do the work that the ambiguity is presenting to you? Because here's the secret. If you don't do it this time around, it's going to come back around next time and you're going to have to do it in a year, in five years, in ten years. It's not going away because you're not growing. You're not facing it. And it did it to me. And until I faced my demons, and until I faced my problems, and I faced those issues every single day of my life, until I knew what it was at the core that was wounded, that needed help, that needed to be addressed, and stopped blaming others, and stopped running from it, and stopped ignoring it, I couldn't do my own work. And then, in fact, I couldn't be helpful to anybody else. I told you, this is graduate school stuff. This is advanced level stuff. This is not easy stuff. If you want to be in covenant relationship with the most powerful being in the universe, he's saying, I want it big time. I want it, I want it profound. And I want all of you. I don't want church pieces that get all dressed up on Sunday and look real nice 
and can pass communion trays. I want your gut. I want your soul. I want your dreams. I want your fears. I want your anxieties. I want your worries. I want it all. That's vassal relationship with the sovereign king. That, that ain't religion. That's spiritual. That's soul stuff. That's all. That's living in the ambiguity. It prepares us for that next phase. The other thing I want to say to you about that in-between time, when everything you're doing is not working, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. It means nothing's wrong with you. Because what happens is, when old Don looks at my problem, and I try this and it doesn't work, and I try that and it doesn't work, and I try the other and it doesn't work, what do I start thinking about me? Something wrong with my thinking. There's something wrong with my approach. There's something wrong with my solutions. And, and I've got it worse than you all do, because I'm a trained academic. I'm a trained academic, which means I'm supposed to be able to get out a pad of paper, write down some notes, come up with a chart, and think my way out of these things. Many times, the thought that we have to confront is that the answer coming from God is, Don, there's nothing wrong with you. I just need you to wait upon me. I am trying to teach you some things. You remember what Jesus said? He said, come after me. My yoke is easy. easy. Yoke is not, it doesn't also mean yoke of oxen, it can also mean my course of study. In other words, what he says, sign up for my class. This ain't hard stuff. In other words, what he's saying is, I've got some things I want to teach you, but I need to stop you. I need you to pause so that we can sit in the ambiguity and we can figure this thing out and we can make things better. It is the most loving God. And why we turn him into some kind of mean old guy with a beard and a fly swatter waiting to whack <laughs> us is beyond me. Right. <laughs> I don't understand it. End of the story. End of the story. I sat there in that big old tall downtown building in Dallas for a year studying that big old chart trying to figure out why will my major professor not let me graduate? Why am I having to jump through all these hoops? What are they possibly doing? God can't possibly, you know, this is just not fair. I had a million different complaints. 25 years later, I'm at the conclusion of my work at OC. I've spent a year looking for another position. University jobs, it was a minute of a bad economy, weren't a lot of jobs around, I couldn't find anything. Finally, my best friend in the world, Scott Johnson, calls me on the phone from Dallas and he said, I'm sending two plane tickets to you. You're going to fly to Phoenix and there's an interview set up next Tuesday. He worked for a company called Accenture and he said, your doctorate's in training and development. We've got a training division there that sends guys out to do corporate training and consulting. He said, if you can talk this partner into hiring you, you got a job. So I'm sitting there on the flight all the way to Phoenix thinking, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm a career academic and marriage shrink. How am I going to talk this guy into doing this? <laughs> we sit down for breakfast and I'm looking at this guy and he says, do you know much about our company? No, sir, I don't. He said, well, he said, Accenture is the world's largest information technology consulting firm. Said, thousands and hundreds of thousands of consultants all over the world. He said, we began in downtown Dallas. Originally, we were Anderson Consulting. <laughs> Professional Education Division. We were founded by a guy named Dr. James Caldwell. And he said, the basis of our consulting practice is something called Method E. <laughs> and I kind of laughed and thought, I've read the Dead Sea Scrolls on that one. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, I believe I can help you. And he hired me that day. 
but I had to wait 25 years with that ambiguity before God showed me why I had to jump through those hoops. But he knew what he was doing. Ladies and gentlemen, our God is an awesome God. He knows what he is doing if we will simply allow him to be God in our lives. God bless you. Thanks for having me back.